So we came to Anaconda, just quickly as an aside. Anaconda begins, massive engagement. I'm down in Kandahar, 16 horrible Afghan road hours away. I mean horrible. I mean there's bandits, Taliban, this, that. You've got to arm up, get a couple of police or others to come with you. It's a terrible, terrible journey and it obviously takes a, quite a while. So the battle begins. It's raging. I contact New York. Keen to go. Ready to go. Boys are all fired up. Forward drives are packed. Give me the order. No, we want you to go to Kandahar Airfield and do the resupply story. Well, that didn't entirely appeal, but I went out for a day. I, mean, I am a good soldier. <laughs> Seriously, I did. By the sad day, however, um, they'd had a few people on the ground and New York contacted me on the Saturday night via satellite phone and said, uh, yeah, look, uh, just wondering, um, how are you placed to uh, push up to uh, Charlicott right now? Um, turns out we're not getting quite the stuff we want. We thought, you know, we'll see what you can do. Mad Australian, you know. Who somehow seems to be able to file legible copies. Um, I said, that'd be great. Um, however, I have a small confession to make. We're already here. <laughs> and indeed, I have a famous photo taken by a famous Brisbaneite. Well, famous to me. Um, and a journalist, another News Limited refugee, who I'd helped go to Time magazine, and unfortunately now with its demise, he's back at the Australian, a chap by the name of Rory Callanan, um, who um, is the son of our former High Court Justice. Anyway, so um, Rory showed up in Afghanistan, underfunded, underpaid, and not sure why he was there, but that was quite amusing. Um, but Rory took some rather famous photos of that little trip. And um, when I was telling Time magazine in New York that, well, we're already here, well, are you close to the battlefield? It's been sealed off. I said, well, I don't know. The um, walls are shaking. A bit of mud fell through the roof a bit a while ago. They're putting some straw up there now. Um, yeah, I reckon we're close, eh? Hey? We'd driven into this small village right on the edge of the battlefield from a back direction that the Americans didn't expect anyone to be stupid enough to use because we were coming from Kandahar, using local knowledge, away we went. Well, village, safest place to spend the night in a hairy place, lots of Al-Qaeda, lots of Taliban, big battle going on, let's go to the police station. Pretty good idea, eh? So when we went, did the meet and greet, they were a bit suspicious, we were a bit suspicious. We killed a sheep, we're fine. <laughs> I had a rather pleasant night with those chaps, actually. A couple of days later, I took Rory down there. We got some wonderful photos of me and Rory in our local dress holding very colourful AK-47s waving at a camera. <laughs> Unfortunately, the police chief and all his men who I'd slept with and been hanging around with, um, last I heard, they were in Guantanamo Bay. Um, turns out they were, were Al-Qaeda. Um, Afghan Al-Qaeda, which is rare, but they were Al-Qaeda. They were nice to me. <laughs> oh. So anyway, boring history of Afghanistan. Um, we come to the end of 2002. Um, war is looming in Iraq. Um, I'm about to have a son, so I come home to Sydney. Jack is born, and uh, unfortunately at 21 days of age, Daddy set off. To, um, to enter Iran illegally and then to illegally cross the border into northern Iraq. Um, at 21 days. Yeah. Anyway, you know, I went. There, I, um, I was not one of the embedded journalists. Um, I'm a big fan of embeds. I know they're much maligned. I don't know if any of you are aware. Basically, that's a system where a journalist is allowed to attach to uh, an American, British, Estonian, Georgian, um, even Chilean, Spanish unit, not Australian, but everyone else, where you can go and just move with the soldiers, live with the soldiers, see what the soldiers are doing. Much criticism about this process, even though it's been active since the American Civil War. 
because um, there's questions about censorship, you know, what you see, what you don't see, what you're allowed to do, yada, yada, yada. I'm not a big fan of the um, embeds uh, censorship view. I've been blessed with embeds. Point being this, um, the film, the images that if any of you have, you know, cast your, could cast your mind back to 2003, and I wouldn't blame you if you didn't, um, all those scenes of American uh, columns of American armour charging north across the Kuwaiti border, blazing a trail to Baghdad. And what was a brilliantly conceived and executed exercise in what's called manoeuvre warfare that took down a nation in three weeks. Now, we all may have our varying views on why they took down that nation. Um, and I certainly have some views on what happened after they took down that nation. But um, the point being, that was a highly successful operation and that's what dominated the, the media images. That's what you all saw. The American 4th Infantry Division was supposed to enter th from the Mediterranean, led by a general who's a very dear friend of mine, great big bear of a man. Looks like he could crush your skull with just his hand. But he's really a gentle soul. And um, the fourth idea was going to come through Turkey, enter northern Iraq and blaze down from the north. Unfortunately, the Turkish parliament, good Muslims as they are, concerned about their street, concerned about the broader Arab street, at the last minute said, no, fourth ID, you don't have access rights, you can't come through here. So they had to turn around on the aircraft carriers, go all the way down through the Suez, come back up and come through Kuwait. I experienced that war, the Northern War. It's a war that none of you have probably heard about or seen yet because there's very little footage. There was hundreds of journalists up there, but it wasn't the war that, Everyone was interested in, so anything from there was only marginalised. It was very hard to see the war there. Very hard. You had to work to see that war. I have journalist colleagues, respected war correspondents, who were with us there in the north, and they said, oh, there was no war to see up here. God, it was nothing, you know, tension and this and that, but there was no war. And I would look at them and just think, well, you didn't work hard enough, did you? Because the, when the American battle plan went askew with the Turkish parliament's refusal to allow them to come in, what we then saw was a northern war, which has been unspoken of virtually to this day, um, something I hope to address. What you saw there was a rerun of Afghanistan. U.S. Green Berets, Delta Force operators, CIA paramilitaries, well-practiced individuals inserted into a region with a fairly impressive pre-existing paramilitary organisation called the Peshmerga, Kurdish word that translates literally as those who face death. And boy, they do. Oh, the stories. Anyway. Um... So the war up there, for me, was a reminder of Afghanistan. Iraq is a desert. Trust me, it's a desert. When I say desert, I mean desert. In the north, it's a totally separate country. Lush, rolling green hills. It snows. In January, February 2003, while all my colleagues were down in Kuwait in those obnoxious chemical suits running around, um, sweating it out and charging through the desert and blistering in heat. We were running from Al-Qaeda mortars in three feet of snow because of the elevation and because of the topography. Either way, very different war. Green Berets, Rambos, not Rambos, that's got a pejorative context. Green Berets, professional special forces officers running around with Kurdish local fighters. Rerun of Afghanistan. It was a fascinating jewel of military history to witness. One book's been written about it, a semi-official history of the Green Beret involvement in, um, in the war. I don't know if this is right, but in a, with a group of Green Berets that I was with in a battle against these Al-Qaeda blokes, 
because there was two front lines up there, not just one. There was the front line against Saddam, and then there was the little front line against Al Qaeda. <sighs> We're running out of time. If there's one thing I'll leave you with, let me let it be this. In the book that I've been paid a lot of money to write and I'm not writing. It turns out it's a cathartic emotional journey. Literally. Um, I saw several things up there in the north that in my book I'm calling in a, like a rough chapter heading the poor tense. The invasion of Iraq was not the war, just in case any of you are confused. Like I said, a brilliantly conceived and executed piece of manoeuvre warfare that set the stage for the war. The war began in the summer of 2003. It didn't begin in March and April. Saddam's statue coming down, all of that hoopla, that's not the war in Iraq, trust me. I lived the war in Iraq. I was there seven, eight years straight. Seven. Came home one month a year to see my boy. Maybe a month in summer, a month in winter. Then back to the war. It started after the invasion. And all I'll say is, quick note, one thing to take away is that the war started after the invasion. And God bless the ABC for running ABC2 right now, running Generation Kill. I don't know if any of you caught it. Um, it's a dramatisation of a really well-written book by a journalist who was embedded with the uh, Marine First Recon in the invasion. Three weeks he was there. Outstanding book. Talk about capturing the moment. He really, really did. Anyway, they've made a, like an eight-part dramatisation that played in America a couple of years ago. It's fantastic. If you get a chance, do watch it. I think the first or second episode played last night. Um, it'll just give you a taste. Point being this. And I'll conclude with this. In the north, I saw the first ever suicide bombing of the war in Iraq. And it occurred before George Bush pushed the button to send the first missile. The war began March 20. On February 26, a friend and I were bunkered down in Kurdish trenches facing the Al-Qaeda guys. We were getting pummeled by mortars, all of which was a ruse to keep our heads down to let a suicide bomber come back through the civilian area and detonate at a checkpoint in a taxi. I had the grave misfortune of them witnessing the second suicide bombing of the Iraq war, which was March 21, the day after the formal commencement of the war, when the same group of individuals, Ansar al-Islam, group linked to al-Qaeda, playing with chemical weapons, yada, yada, yada. After being bombed by Tomahawk and cruise missiles on the night of the 20th, they didn't think they'd just sit back and let that go unanswered. So when a checkpoint of theirs was overrun at a, you know, just a normal intersection, they decided to send a refugee taxi out with the rest of the refugee taxis. Unfortunately, that refugee taxi pulled up next to an Australian cameraman before it detonated. And it was the ABC cameraman, Paul Moran, from Foreign Correspondent, and um, the journalist, Eric Campbell. Those incidents and some others that were up there, even before the war actually began, I look back now and I realise that I had the secret soil. I had the elements of the real Iraq war to come and I didn't even know it. By God, I know it now. 